July 2018 marked the reuniting of over 200 descendants of the Pond Beat and Mullins Flat communities on land that is now Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. Mostly African Americans, they were the people who lived in thriving communities that emerged in the late 1800s and into the 1900s, characterized by family farming, sugar canning, religion, education, health, and recreation. Nearly 100 years ago, 96-year-old Hody McCraw was born in Mullins Flat. A retired educator, Mrs. McCraw now lives in Northwest Huntsville with her husband, retired principal, Homer McCraw. Joined by Reverend Shante E. Knotts, Brenda Chun visits the home of Mr. and Mrs. McCraw to recount the Nananajarian's journey and go on the record. As we start today, I would like to ask you to share your background in the Huntsville community, your earliest days and some of what was your background in Huntsville. Uh, I am the daughter of Jared uh, and Etta Lanier. I was born in the small community known as Mullins Flat, which is now called Redstone Arsenal, Alabama. I lived there with my grandparents until my grandmother became blind. And my uh, reason for being there, as I sat and reminisced about my early childhood, was because of the death of my mother at, a, at a, when we were very young, ages three months and uh, three years. So we stayed there with grandmother and grandfather until our aunt came to uh, get us and bring us to Huntsville. My uh, ancestors came from our Virginia and relocated in Huntsville. Uh, primarily uh, the occupation there was farming. As I sat and reminisced about this early childhood and the different communities that I had lived in, I am eternally grateful for the different, uh, as differently as the homes were that I lived in. I am grateful that they were Christian homes. I, they had certain basic values, at which I do appreciate, and the opportunity there to learn about Jesus and our surroundings and to be reared by such parents, I think is quite a blessing. I am just struck by you saying that because in uh, the Mullins Flat Pond Beat community, and that's the place of your origin, uh, this was quite a complex community. And I think that as you experienced in your home life the importance of faith, many in those communities uh, experienced that as well. There were large uh, family homes, uh, as well as a number of churches, farms, businesses, and what have you. So, uh, in many ways, uh, as you speak of the blessing of that experience, it also is was a hallmark of the community. Would you say that that was true? Yes, that is true. Because as I remember, there were uh, other businesses, stores, and we even had what we call, we call at that time, the peddler which is referred to now as the traveling art store. Uh, and uh, there were schools in each community, as I remember, at least one in each uh, community. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I'm familiar with the uh, community and the uh, environment of the Mullen Flat area. And I think the school there was Civil Hill. There were other local uh, communities around, but I, I don't remember them too much. However, I do recall Pond Beat 
as uh, having a school, I think it was the Horton School. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were children, so far as the education and some of the other values of the community, they weren't, they weren't very educated people as we would speak of nowadays, but uh, they had the intelligence and the concern and love for their family, and they valued Christianity and faith and also uh, education. I know that uh, I attended uh, Silver Hill for about three months, and that's when my aunt decided that I was of age to come and uh, enroll in Huntsville. Okay. There were other uh, parents there. Uh, they were able to send their children to boarding school or else to send them to Huntsville to live with relatives so that they could uh, continue with their education. I remember some of the activities that uh, we had there are uh, as children. Uh, we would help with the gardening and we'd have uh, the other families were mostly own farms or else they were called sharecroppers. And so grateful for the opportunity of the uh, community to live in the different communities that I have lived in. And as differently as they were, to know that even down uh, in Mullins Flat at that time, the people were, the parents, were still concerned with the advancement of their children and their future. And they knew that through education, that was their better chance. So with the sharecropping, even though their uh, income and all was meager, they still provided in some manner the best that they could for the benefit of the children and their future. And I admire that and I do remember that. And they were also very active in their church. They attended church. They uh, visited their relatives mostly on Sunday and we would fellowship and uh, have dinner together. And I could tell then, and I remember, that there was unity and love within the community. We would also have uh, some of the ladies formed a quilting group. And I remember this very well because they met in the, my grandmother's home frequently because of sister and myself. We were underage and they didn't uh, have the transportation and all to carry us out as often. So the ladies just decided that they would come and quilt at grandmother's home. And I remember the frame and everything and how it was set up and some of the ladies that would come frequently. I would just want to ask you, you have such wonderful memories of the community in Mullins Flat and I wonder if um, you had a sense of it being a large community or a small community. What was your sense of um, the type of community that it was with so many vital activities taking place? Well, I would say it wasn't a very small and neither very large. It was a, I would just a regular, just normal, a size normal size mm -hmm. where you would have the uh, benefit of knowing your neighbors, even though the houses were spacious so far as the distance from each other. We didn't live as closely there as we live here. Mm -hmm. The houses weren't as close but for the distance between the homes, you could still see that there was unity there. You're, you're mentioning many of what would be termed strengths of the community. Yes. Uh, the value of education, caring for family members, yes. neighbors, the activities. Yes. And um, I'm, it just makes me think, are there other strengths that uh, you experienced there that were a part of that community? Yes. Um, and any other examples? Yes, I remember there were some people there that my grandfather and the family knew and they didn't uh, have the hogs uh, 
as my grandfather had, mm -hmm. I would say. Their farm wasn't as large, and they didn't have access, especially the ones on the share that shared the crop. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the uh, food that they probably needed or wanted. But any time that he would uh, kill hogs, he would always, grandmother, he and grandmother would always prepare a package, especially for the ones that they knew needed it or had more children than the other. That's, a, that's a wonderful aspect of community living, to look out for the less fortunate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And they taught us to share. Mm -hmm. And we would have church picnics and dinners together. And uh, it seemed to, to me, as I can remember, it seemed like a stable community mm -hmm. where you the environment was conducive to uh, rearing children. Mm -hmm. And as we often say, sometimes we think about people, but we don't share as we should. Mm -hmm. I remember very vividly, uh, even in Palm Beach, my grandfather had her sister there and knew some of the other, uh, her neighbors. And sometimes uh, one would be ill, and they would need a person to sit with sometime, even at night, to give them some rest from taking care of the uh, sick person. And grandpapa would go, grandfather would go over and stay with them and uh, also uh, carry them food or whatever way they could offer support. Mm -hmm. They would willingly do it. And it seemed as if they would have prayer meetings and they would go to the home and even pray in the homes, not only at the church. Mm -hmm. I remember that and I was about six years old when I really left mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mullins Flat. Mm -hmm. As you describe this, Mrs. McGraw, I cannot think of anything that this community left to be desired. It, uh, it may have been poor and it may have been an emerging community, but the value for education, for faith, for charity, uh, looking out for those who, you know, who um, cannot do for themselves the, you know, the activities, wholesome activities. Yes. I really, I just cannot um, see what the community left to be desired. And so it, um, I am curious though for your grandfather, uh, he farmed and so was the farm the way that you Fed the family, and then you sold uh, the rest to. How did how was the farm productive in yes, terms of making was. a living? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. He it truly fed the family mm -hmm. because they had an orchard, and grandmother would always make preserves and uh, canned food mm -hmm. and things of that sort. And that way. I don't remember them having to go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And we even had a smokehouse where he would cure the meat and put it in this house. Mm -hmm. So I, the only thing that I can remember when he would have cotton bales to bring to Huntsville down on Brown Street was the gin. Mm -hmm. And he would always come back with a, a lot of uh, things I would say goodies for us, mm -hmm. cheese and all kinds of cakes and candy and things of that, that sort. That was a bonus thing. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then we had popcorn because he would grow the sugar cane mm -hmm. and we would sit and at night and do the uh, popcorn mm -hmm. he would. Mm -hmm. And there were just the two of us, the two mm -hmm. little children, grandmother mm -hmm. and grandfather. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do remember that uh, he would go to town and carry different things for mm -hmm. sale. He made uh, molasses mm -hmm. from the sugar cane. Mm -hmm. And I remember them mm -hmm. coming together and doing that right there at the, at the house. It make, I, I know that it must have been a challenge in those days. This is what, the early 1900s? Yes. Um, Yes. Perhaps 1910, 20? Uh, it 
for me, it had to be after 22. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that far back okay. in my days. The 19, uh, 1920s. The 20s, the latter okay. part of the 20s okay. and the uh, 30s. Okay. And uh, that's when I, uh, my grandfather had a car and most people in the community, there were very few cars and everyone mm. didn't have one. But he was always willing to share the uh, transportation mm -hmm. and help others out. And uh, another way that he provided help for the other, uh, some of the other people in the community, there were young men that uh, he would get to come and help him with the farm. And they stayed, he mm -hmm. had a room, and they stayed one at a time. They would have their room and they would stay and help him with the crop and that way it was giving him, they gave him food and lodging mm -hmm. and whatever else, awesome. you know, if mm -hmm. he had to go to town for the sickness or anything like that, mm -hmm. they, they shared that. That's and, wonderful. I, I've, I've known you all of my life and um, I am so happy that you had such a wonderful, wholesome start, and I, I know that there were challenges, and we're going to talk about some of those challenges, but um, the, hearing this, I've never heard this before, and it just makes me feel just so wonderful for you that you had that type of goodness in your early days, and I think that that is absolutely um, reflective of why we're here now. Um, still continuing that uh, yes. experience and tradition. That's right. And I can't help but mention there were others in the community that shared as well. And I know we would go to Palm Beach sometime because Grandpapa had a strip of land over there and we'd go with him to pick cotton. Mm -hmm. And the long, they had the long sacks, we would call them, or bags, that they put around their neck. They were mm -hmm. cotton. We made mm -hmm. them. And our sister would be on grandmother's, and I would be on grandpapa's, and they would just drag you drag along. Us along as they, <laughs> as they picked as they picked cotton. And then that they, must have been so much fun. It was. <laughs> and then we would have uh, they would prepare lunch, and at a certain hour, twelve, mm -hmm. we would go to a, a nice little spot there and have uh, mm -hmm. lunch. And we would she would carry other cousins, my uncle's children live right down the road from us on Grandpapa's land. And uh, we all would gather there and some of the cousins, mm -hmm. they would probably be over on at one field, but we would all come together uh, at lunchtime and share and the fellowship and joy. And then we would play there because most of them were too young at that time to be left home by themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, in um, it, you were about six when you moved to Huntsville. Yes, proper. Six, six, were you aware of why you were leaving? Um, why you were leaving the Mullins Flat community and moving to Huntsville? Was there? And my question is because as, as we moved into your school age and coming to Huntsville, there must have been uh, some emerging racial awareness. And as we talk about civil rights in Huntsville, uh, I'm coming to the question, when were you first aware of um, the separation of the black and white communities in Huntsville? Well, I really, uh, uh, shortly after I moved to Huntsville with my aunt, I didn't, in that particular area, I didn't recognize or know too much about it. Maybe I was just a bit too young to understand, but I never really thought about it, even though it might have, uh, I might have been uh, aware of it to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I really began to think about it and become concerned, was when I, after uh, I went to, with my father, after he remarried, and we moved out west, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And there I 
uh, my sister and myself, we became a part of a blended family. And uh, we had, uh, we did experience uh, separation at that particular time. Mm -hmm. But we were there in the community with other whites. And oh, I did forget, once while I was over on the, with my aunt over near the hospital, that was my, as they say, old stopping ground. Mm -hmm. I the did, Huntsville Hospital. Huntsville, and mm -hmm. even the old Huntsville Hospital, mm -hmm. before it was built there, I remember the building that was down the street. Of course, they had closed the old hospital when I lived there. It was called Half Street, and then uh, now it's St. Clair. Mm -hmm. But I do remember uh, my aunt that lived up on Triana Road. Uh, there was a policeman that lived right next door to her. Now that was the very first experience of uh, whites, uh, interracial I would say, mm -hmm. uh, interaction with the other race I should say. But uh, they used to uh, come over and borrow meal or milk or whatever mm -hmm. the mother mm -hmm. uh, might need, need. Mm -hmm. because she was home and she had quite a few children. Mm -hmm. That was very, very, the next door to us. But I still didn't, it didn't dawn on me mm -hmm. that it was, you know, because we played together all mm -hmm. in the yard mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really get that type of uh, impression or I didn't, I wasn't aware of it, I will say. But when I really became aware of it was when we were, uh, my sisters and myself were able to go to town, go downtown. We had to walk from the back of the cemetery on Hall Street to Crest. That was our place of shopping. That tradition mm -hmm. continued even when I was a girl yeah, yeah, in yeah. Huntsville. That was, a that was a famous spot where you could go and do your little shopping. Mm -hmm. So we would uh, see these two fountains in crests. One had color, the other had white. And we would stand and just look at them and wonder what was the difference. Why do we have to do drink out of this and they drink out of that? Because, as my sister said once, the water is the same color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, Those are the questions of a young yeah, mind. Uh -huh. it's like, what's so that I about? guess I really became aware of it, as I said, but I didn't think that much of the separation until my early ch childhood, as you had said. And uh, I guess since we played together, because even on Hall Street there were white families that lived, and they'd come to the up to the yard. They didn't just come in, but we'd all gather at the gate, and we'd stand and talk and all. And they did the same thing. The parents did the same for our parents. They would come and talk. So by having uh, the experience like that, I think. I didn't really, it didn't bother me too much, the separation. I wasn't aware these were experiences that I accepted, I think, as a way of life. Mm -hmm. It's and the I, way that it was. That's right. Mm -hmm. And we, however, we did notice that some of the insurance people or some of the people that would come by begging for food or something like that, some of the persons would ask grandmother, uh, would call our grandparents, uncle and aunt, Annie. They would say, Amy, Amy. We say aunt and uncle. But anyway, they would, we would ask, why did they call them that, you know? So one day, my grandmother did speak up, and she let the uh, young man know that she wasn't very appreciative of him referring her uh, to her in that manner. But she asked him, she said, why do you call me Amy? I'm not your mother's sister and I'm not your daddy's sister. And that's the first time that I really thought too 
much about it, you know. Mm -hmm. That there there is a, a time that you can just take liberties yes. that are not really uh, yes. appropriate or uh -huh. being extended. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we were allowed to walk to town, as I said before, and saw these fountains there, and then we would turn around and we would touch hunch each other. We would want a sandwich. They were at the counter of this little small restaurant. To the left of the store, and it's really at the front when you go in. But we would ask, we would say, they all sitting eating, they would have their Coca-Colas and drinking and all. And we would wonder, you know, why we couldn't do that. So I think that really struck a nerve there. We thought about that. It gave us a different impression and made us become more of aware of our environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now would these be, um, were you, would you be entering the council high experience uh, or the council experience at this time you've moved into Huntsville and uh, you're in the area of the Huntsville Hospital, Saint, where it is now St. Clair, yes. and uh, were you then attending uh, William Hooper Council School? Yes. When I first came, my first the first community that I lived in was in that area, the Huntsville Hospital area, mm -hmm. uh, Madison Street and all of, over in that area. Yes. And that's when I was enrolled in the uh, council, in council High School mm -hmm. in the first grade. And after my mother, after my father remarried, we went out to our, uh, out west, past the Black Cemetery and lived there, and we still had to walk from there to Council High mm -hmm. School. There were no buses or anything of that sort. And uh, I really, it really bothered us to, this wasn't so much of integration or anything at that particular time, but it was just the distance mm -hmm. that we had to walk, and we had to pay to go to school when I was with my aunt. Mm -hmm. I didn't, but they said we were outside of the limit, our uh, city limit, and we had to pay. And I remember so vividly, my father would work all day long, come home for lunch, walk back to Jefferson Street, where the Alabama Grocery Company is. Then at night come home, get a bath, walk to California Street to talk to the uh, to the superintendent about our tuition because it was $75 each My goodness. for each semester for each child mm -hmm. and at the time there were four of us in school there and we didn't always have it. That seemed exorbitant. It yeah. was as That's I thought. Really but I remember life. that very vividly mm -hmm. but I've always attended Council High School. Well, I commend your um, uh, pursuit of education, your persistence, and you're a proud graduate of the class of 1941 from William Hooper Council High School. And uh, as you come, come of age here in Huntsville and you're uh, graduating high school, you're looking, did you go right to college? You went to Alabama A&M? Yeah. Yes, we uh, did go to Alabama A&M, but it wasn't right Direct, away. We, okay. we mm -hmm. missed the first semester. I think it, they were on semester basis at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. We did enter, and uh, I did uh, finish there. Mm -hmm. it, the uh, I imagine the uh, educational experiences must have been a challenge. Uh, you've already mentioned the long distance that you had to walk, the fees that had to be paid. I'm certain that conditions, you know, health, weather, you know, there were many things intervening in uh, getting access to education. So when I say that you persisted with that, I really do recognize that that must have been an enormous um, experience to, yes, to go through. And then when we started A&M, we uh, weren't really able to stay on the campus. Mm -hmm. So we were called day students. 
but there was a bus furnished by one of the faculty members on a and campus, Mr. Merle Berry, and he would come around and pick up the children mm -hmm. all over Huntsville. And we would always have to meet him at the cemetery gate. Some mornings we were late getting up, and we didn't get a chance to get dressed and <laughs> breakfast, and we would run from Hall Street to the Times Building, because that was about the last stop that he would make on his way to Alabama A&M. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but you got there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Quite a distance. Yeah, yes. and then some days when we would have classes and the uh, exams, we would get out early, and I remember walking to Chase, and I caught the train there for 10 cents and came back to Huntsville. <laughs> Well, it was quite what an, an experience. experience. Yes, it was quite an experience. But I wanted to ask you with respect to segregation and integration, uh, social scientists and researchers tell us the obvious advantages of segregation for the white community. But I wonder from your own perspective if you were consciously aware of any particular disadvantages or advantages that segregation had in the black community. Uh, in other words, would you say um, you had a sense of any kind of loss or gain as a result of integration in this, in this community? Yes, I did. I thought that uh, segregation was always and unjust that uh, we had to face and, and, uh, it, and it wasn't, I felt that it wasn't uh, justifiable, it was so inhumane and uh, I felt at that time that uh, we were denied of our rights as human beings, as students and people as a whole and there were certain uh, advantages or disadvantages. I saw it more or less as a disadvantage mm -hmm. because we were denied of certain jobs. There were certain uh, facilities that we still could not uh, go into and we had to always sit at the back of the bus and uh, the uh, and just the mannerism and the way that they would treat you, they would call the men boys or call you girls. And there were so many other disadvantages like that so far as certain jobs where you had to be better qualified than the other race in order to get the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when it came to voting, we were given uh, even to register to vote. There were many times that you would go and the booth or wherever it was supposed to be in, that it was closed or something, some excuse. And we always had to pay poll tax in order. And I wanted to, I have that receipt of one of my uh, payments for poll tax, oh but I just couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were schools that, you know, that we could not attend. Mm -hmm. And there were so many other things that uh, we could mention that uh, I felt it was an injust to uh, us as a race of people. I was just recently watching a uh, clip from the 60s. Uh, we're here uh, celebrating about 50 years since the assassination of Dr. King. and. Uh, reflecting back on the integration of the schools in Little Rock, yes. Arkansas, and one of the students at the time, one of the white students, uh, was adamant in saying, uh, separate but equal, separate but equal, why do they have to, to come over here? Um, and there was a perception by some that as long as we have ours and you have yours, that you're happy and we're happy, uh, is, are there any advantages that you feel the black community experienced 
uh, in segregation? Or I know you said that they're largely disadvantages, and, and we know what those disadvantages were. But were there any advantages, do you think? There might have been. I guess I focused more on the disadvantages <laughs> than I did the of advantages. Of course. Uh, but there is one uh, advantage so far as before separation, even in the schools for the children. We tended as a, uh, as a group of teachers, we had one-on-one -on -one relationship with the children especially the slower learners. And we had groups, and I think the children profit uh, from their experience when we could work with them one-on-one -on -one and try to help them better themselves. Mm -hmm. It was in reading or math or whatever the subject matter was. And um, I felt that was... Uh, and then we could relate to them. They would come to school. I remember even after integration when I was over in, at uh, New Hope, mm -hmm. uh, I had one little fellow. And his hair was never attended to. Mm -hmm. He would get up and come to school and with feathers and cotton and all in his, yes, in his uh, hair. And I would take him back to the water fountain it was a little closed-in place, and I'd get a paper towel and wet it, and just dampen it, and just go through his hair. Mm -hmm. Because the other children uh, observed that, mm -hmm. and they weren't too kind for him, at, uh, to him at times. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. So those are some of the uh, things that I think we missed out on as being integrated. The other uh, teachers, they weren't aware of their background. They didn't know their circumstances. And many children would go to school without lunch and all of that. Of course, they did have free lunch, but they'd go to school without breakfast. Well, we could relate to it in the black schools, mm -hmm. and we would make provision for them probably to have milk or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Even, even today, those are very much factors in especially public education today. Yeah. Uh -huh. The mm -hmm. school feeding programs yes. and mm -hmm. uh, care, care for children and teachers being able to relate yeah. to the um, background yeah. that Absolutely. the children come from. So yeah. some things change and yeah. the more they change, the more they stay the same. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, I hope I answered that. You did. I'm, I'm hearing you say that there seemed to be more of a personal touch. Mm -hmm. Yes. That yes. Uh, students, the teacher-student relationship. Caring. That's mm -hmm. right. Yes. And you, naturally, you could relate to that better than the other teachers right. because they weren't aware mm -hmm. of some of mm -hmm. the problems that existed in our homes mm -hmm. or even in our communities. Mm -hmm. So it's very understandable. But still, it... Uh, Push you to a certain disadvantage. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my next question is, uh, could you share some of your impressions or memories uh, from that era in terms of maybe the decade of the 50s or the 60s, uh, the 70s? You've shared the experience of the voting and the poll taxes. Um, yes, I have... Uh, I had mixed emotions, you were frustrated and uh, angry, and you couldn't understand why, just because of the pigmentation of your skin, that you were treated so cruelly. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I thought about uh, the wake-up call when we were, I was encouraged and so elated when uh, Dr. King and other persons had the interest and the courage to speak up and try to better our, our condition as a race of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a wake-up call to us to let us know that uh, we didn't have to uh, accept that because we are human too, just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And we have certain rights and 
the law should be just for everyone and not just for a certain class of people because of your pigmentation. Give us a chance to, uh, to learn and advance. And then I thought about all the contributions. I can't elaborate on it because I don't remember all of them, but I do know that there have been many blacks that have contributed to the society Absolutely. and made as a race. And we are smart people and we need to be given a chance. But by Dr. King stepping forth and doing this, it made us become aware of the of our rights and justice that we had been so long denied of. And it gave us a our sense of uh, of responsibility, a sense of uh, of uh, belonging, mm -hmm. and to let them know that we are people with ability, and we do believe in contributing to the society just as everyone else does. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Such a wonderful thing to have a champion and someone to speak on yes. your behalf mm -hmm. and yes. to uh, mm -hmm. yeah. lead the movement. That's right, and we could support, even when they had the sit-ins here in Huntsville, there, I don't know whether it was really true, but as teachers, we, some were told, not by officials, I wasn't told by official, but it was through gossip that you, as a teacher, you can't get involved because of your job. Mm -hmm. And it made you fearful. And I remember very well, I was on Pulaski Pike, and Dr. King, passed, the motorcade passed right by my house, and I was in the room, but I had the blind closed, mm -hmm. and I opened the blind just enough to peep out so I could get a good view of him, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't go to the, he was speaking at the First Baptist Church, and I didn't get a chance, at, yeah, at your church up on the last, mm -hmm. on our church, church street. street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't go, but there were others mm -hmm. that really mm -hmm. uh, went. And your aunt, as one, was very brave. I think she went to Mrs. Washington. Lila Washington. I think <laughs> yes. they told me that she went, and some of the some of the others. You know, she was I our can... history teacher, so she was very, very keen on us being yes. knowledgeable of our history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, let me ask you, what were some of the areas where they had the sit-ins? Do you recall? at Crest, Woolworth, mm -hmm. all those stores, and some of the people were even jailed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the Cash and Mrs. Cash and mm -hmm. some of the others, I can't remember all the names right now because I just haven't you know, done yes. that research, mm -hmm. I forgot. But there were sit-ins and we participated through prayer, mm -hmm. having faith, and then carrying food to the ones that were sitting oh, in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, during that time, uh, how did you feel the people, the Af African American community in the Huntsville area fared with res in comparison to African Americans in other areas of the state or perhaps uh, other areas of the country? Uh, do you think that Blacks here in the Madison County area were worse off or better off uh, than people in other places in terms of their experience with civil rights and so forth. I think we were better off because I think of Bull Connors in our Birmingham mm -hmm. and all the disasters that they had to go through, the crisis that they had to go through. We had none of that here. And I think it was due to probably to faith. And we showed respect for each other. Even our, I think we adapted Dr. King's motto, peace. Yes. And uh, they, the organization, uh, the city and organization, I think it was intelligently uh, organized. Mm -hmm. And I think that helped a lot. And we felt uh, 
bit of uh, of compassion for each other and knew that we were supposed to support, felt that we were supposed to support the uh, community in this. And, excuse me, along with the, the sit-ins, there were other things that took place at that time too. We boycotted some of the stores, and especially on Easter Sunday, I don't it's know. Blue Jeans Blue Sunday. Blue Jeans Sunday. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we didn't have, uh, and really needed something. Some people would go to Tennessee and buy rather than to buy in, in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was a peaceful and intelligently organized and supported, the uh, citizens supported the actions of the cities and the others. I, I have to say this about Blue Jean Sunday. I, in, in a child's <laughs> mind, thought, where are we going to get blue jeans from? <laughs> because I don't think I even knew what blue jeans were. And mm -hmm. it's like, we're going to wear blue jeans. It's like, well, we're going to have to buy them. <laughs> On some level, I understood that even then, that shopping was going to take place, but maybe not all of the frills that we were accustomed to. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask you this. Uh, many people attribute uh, the presence of Redstone, and we know that the communities of Mullins Flats and Pond Beat were vacated that red what became Redstone. Yes. They were the original the people on the land that became Redstone. But um, many believe that the presence of Redstone and then Marshall Space Flight Center also played a role in um, Huntsville's response to uh, desegregation. Yes. And so, do you have any observations or comments about that? I think it did because I think they were aware that uh, the government had intervened and that mm -hmm. would be a disastrous for if they didn't uh, uh, observe the laws uh, so far as integration and all of that, that it would uh, probably cause the Redstone Arsenal to move, or mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that would be a disaster mm -hmm. to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So an abundance of caution and concern. Yes, and uh, mm -hmm. I think just reasonable reasonableness in the response. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. Yes. In your experience, what were some of the more helpful events in achieving nonviolent desegregation? here in Huntsville and the Madison County area? I think it was because of uh, the respect and uh, the compassion. And then they had uh, the policemen, we, they uh, observed the laws and I think the experience and uh, the conditions in Birmingham and other surrounding areas had been so publicized until they didn't want the same thing to happen here in Huntsville that happened there. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, mm -hmm. There, I just recently watched a documentary that talked about uh, the fact that it was part of Dr. King's strategy yes. to attract media attention because some things would have just continued. Mm -hmm. And so that media attention had a positive impact on yes, what happened Yes, yes, I here. think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. I think it was the churches played, that played a, a big part in it, too. I do believe the churches had a uh, responsibility there, too. And they would have uh, prayer meetings, and we would discuss ways in which we could conduct ourselves and do things that would uh, help to promote uh, segregation, integration in a more peaceful and more intelligent way. Mm -hmm. And I think that being surrounded by the different schools here, the University, mm -hmm. Oakwood and uh, A&M and the other schools, and then the churches uh, doing their part, having, uh, they talked about it and discussed and would, uh, you know, in their sermons and things of that mm -hmm. sort. I think that played a part. Yeah. That's wonderful. 
You, you mm -hmm. raise a very important point about the role of the colleges and the universities because, um, and Redstone as well, yeah. because there was a large professional group yes. here in Huntsville. Yes. Uh, you're a retired educator, your, your husband, Mr. Mm -hmm. Homer McCraw, was a Madison County principal and yes. uh, you were a classroom teacher, of course, and so Alabama A&M, Oakwood, uh, then UAH, it really yes. turned out a, a number of professionals who yes. had something, you know, invested in the community yes. that uh, they wanted to protect. And then, of course, the arsenal bringing in the workforce that it brought in. So Huntsville mm -hmm. has always been a little different from other areas of the state right. uh, mm -hmm. in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I remember they brought in National Guards too, especially when, uh, I believe when uh, Sonny Health had entered uh, Fifth Avenue School there. Mm -hmm. But it was peaceful and they had, and Veronica, Veronica Pearson, I think she was one of the mm -hmm. ones too, the girl. That one of the female students. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I think all of that played a, a part in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, the last question I was going to ask you is whether you could recount any uh, particular experience or vivid memories uh, from that time period, and, and you have. Uh, and I'm getting the sense that it was was not an easy time to live through, but it was easier uh, to live perhaps in the Huntsville area, would you say, yes. uh, than it was in uh, some other areas where you could have found yourself at mm -hmm. that, at that time. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, I think this was the better a area because of the factors that we have already discussed mm -hmm. that helped. And then the parents and were educated to a certain extent, yes. you know. And we, uh, they just had us, impressed us that you don't, uh, as my mother uh, would say, you just don't do things, stoop to their level. Mm -hmm. You let them know that we are above that and we looked ab beyond our problems and try to show respect and compassion and just wasn't violent. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, I think as a whole, Huntsville was the better area mm -hmm. for integration and all of that, even though they did have the, uh, the guards mm -hmm. here for one. Mm -hmm. but sure. How mm -hmm. wonderful it is for you to have us in your home and to be sharing these experiences with us. And so I'm going to ask this question just generally. What haven't we asked you that you want to say? Because I, I just can't, you know, I'm so uh, absolutely impressed with your longevity, with the depth, the breadth of your experiences here in Huntsville. And so there must be something that you want to say that we have not yet asked. And I'll ask that question again if it doesn't <laughs> come this time. Okay, then. I had uh, made a notation here uh, about uh, the future and the present that we suggested. Okay, I, I do have uh, that. I do want to ask uh, because you have seen so much and you've experienced so much. So for the present, and for the future with regard to civil rights in our community and, and for our young people today, what are the needs that exist now? What do we need now um, with regard to civil rights? Uh, I would suggest and recommend that we try to better understand I have a better understanding between the races, more compassion, more interaction with the community, more involvement with the parents, and we would uh, see to each person having the right to share equal 
opportunities, let there be equal opportunities for all, fairness and justice, and practice the laws, the same laws for all citizens. That's that's some a big challenge that uh, uh -huh. we have even now. Um, the I think the gains of the '60s we somehow took for granted. Yes, and that's now right. we see that we still have to work very actively for the gains of the 60s. And That's right. And especially because of this administration, it seems to me that it, it, we aren't getting the support that we should, that it is really has a tendency to be going back mm -hmm. to the days before or when Martin Luther King tried to do, not only for the blacks, but mm -hmm. for the whites, justice for the, all of us, all nations. And, and I think especially when you consider that there, uh, there are his, historic reasons for the federal involvement in yes. uh, so much of what is life today. And um, it, it was a, a remedy for what had happened in the past. So that history is being yeah. overlooked, it seems, more and more. Yes. And I think they should listen to the youth mm -hmm. as well as listen to each other. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. We all need to listen and there's a certain part that everyone can play to make uh, Huntsville or to promote, uh, well I won't say integration, but just to keep in mind that we all are humans and we have the same rights and privileges of everyone else. Mm -hmm. That's just our God-given right. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a, a, a wonderful idea and thought that you have to listen to our young people because as I'm thinking of those young experiences that you had, how much insight and wisdom that you had early mm -hmm. and uh, just uh, I don't know, the sense of community, family, you know, those yes. things that you were exposed to. So even young people have very valid experiences yes. that uh, they can share with us yes. and we can gain value from. Mm -hmm. Do you have a message for the Huntsville community today and for our youth today? You're kind of giving us that, but is there anything in particular for Huntsville and for young people today. Yes, for the Huntsville com community, I, in, in addition to what we have said above about treating all people uh, equally and treat them as you would like to be treated. That's what my mother used to tell me, tell us rather, to live by the golden, golden rule. Do mm -hmm. unto mm -hmm. others as you would want them to do. Mm -hmm to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for the community, I would say in addition to the above suggestions, we would ask when we are in power, what is my purpose? What is my passion? Is it to empower and equip the future generation? Am I prom promoting unity? Am I giving people, or the residents, the due respect and privileges that they so rightly deserve? It gives us a feeling of uh, belongness, of belonging, and a, a, to become a part of the community. And I suggest that try to involve the community, the parents get involved with the schools, and everything, have certain programs set up where we'll actually call for the parents to become involved. And just to remember the, uh, that it isn't the depths from which you come, my mother used to tell me, it isn't the depths from which one comes, but the heights to which we rise. <clears throat> and if we are to rise to these heights, there must be more 
compassion from not only our family, but from the community and the officials. And when you're in power, don't use your power to elevate yourself. But what can you do for the least of us to bring them up where they will have dignity and love for all mankind? It's beautiful. That is very beautiful. That uh, sounds like um, a um, thought that can empower us in our homes in our communities, in our cities, states, and in the nation. It's Absolutely. just a thought that carries us forward in terms of how we should yeah. uh, face the challenges of our lives. And one more thing I would like to say to the youth, that they must listen and try to rise above their poverty or whatever the problem that surround them. Be responsible, regardless of the, of the poverty and injustice that surrounds you. Look beyond the problems. Don't let the problems define you. Education defines you. It tells you what you can do and what you might become, your future will be like. Take advantage of all the opportunities. Be grateful for your abilities. Stay focused and be appreciative, respectful. As I said before, education defines who you are or who you will become. Thank you. Absolutely. That is just wonderful, wonderful sharing. Well, we are at the end of our oral history interview, and I have nothing but appreciation for Mrs. Hody McCraw, who has welcomed us into her home uh, Reverend Shante Knotts from First Missionary Baptist Church who joined us in the interview and uh, all of the wisdom, the knowledge, the insight that has been shared here today by one who is a natural resource for Huntsville and for our community. Thank you so very much. From a grateful community, we appreciate you, Mrs. Thank Hody you. McGraw. And may I say one other thing? Thanks to you, great warriors, <laughs> because I'm not one to go before the public to do any speaking. I remember in my early years at A&M, I would have my lesson prepared, and the teacher would call on me. And I would give her the shortest answer that I could give. And she would walk around and look. She said, come on. Say, continue. And I would kind of close up, shut up. She would be proud of you today. And then she said, she'd walk and she'd take up my tablet where I had my answer. And she'd tell the class, she has it all right here on paper. I'm going to say a word. <laughs>